Jones is my name. I'm a director with Cytorus. We're a data protection consultancy based in Dublin. And uh, we've been working probably about the last three or four years with organizations to prepare for and anticipate their obligations under the new uh, general data protection regulation. By happy coincidence, the legislation is 500 days away on the 10th of January this year. So for today and for your calendars, 465 days to go. Um, if you need to leave now and get ready or do anything in particular, I'll understand. The current legislation, you're probably already aware, there are three formal pieces of legislation that cover the management of personal data within organizations, be it the healthcare, the hospitality, medical, or any other sector. The 88 Act, again from the European legislation from 1981, the 2003 Amendment Act, and the 2011 Electronic Communications Regulation. The good news and the bad news. The good news is that the new regulation in 2018 will only replace the first two. It will not replace the 2011 Electronic Communications Regulation. So what you're doing currently in terms of direct marketing, promoting your products or services through electronic media, that will not go away, to use a phrase. The uh, GDPR will only replace the first two pieces of legislation. And what we look at today is just give you a very high level overview whether your organization is a data controller, exercising discretion around the use of that data, or whether you're a data processor as a service provider providing those services into the data controller community, you will have obligations and you will have changes that you need to be ready for in the coming 460 odd days to be compliant on the same date. A quirk of this legislation, compared to the previous times that new regulation has been handed out, is that it takes effect on the same date across the European Economic Area. That's the 28 member states of the European Union, plus the three member states of the European Free Trade Agreement. This is Brexit agnostic, or Brexit proof. Interestingly, a press release from the British government last week specifically targeted data protection legislation and said whatever else is negotiated, whatever else happens, even in terms of the timeline and rollout of Brexit, we will comply with the GDPR. Now, it sounded generous of them to acknowledge. You'll find out they actually had to anyway, but we'll leave that, that's for another day. So, what we look at today will be to focus on the principles of the GDPR, and I'll try and give some examples of where those principles will impact on organizations over the next few months, and consider as we go through this, how your organization manages that space currently. What you're currently doing in terms of compliance, in terms of focus in terms of transparency and openness to decide, I suppose, or, or consider what needs to be modified. How well do we present ourselves? How well do we explain? How well do we, or how transparently do we offer our services? How clear is it to the individual, be it the service user, the, the recipient of our services, or our client, customer, or prospect? How clear is it to them who we are, what we're about, what we do with their data, and with whom we share it? So we look at all of those con concepts within the context of the, the seven principles. And then, towards the end of it, I'll look at the particular challenges that data controllers and data processors are going to have by virtue of the legislation as it's currently drafted and in pipeline. In terms of implications specifically within the healthcare, and mindful of today's uh, focus on health and pharma, they, they, it's important to notice that there is an expansion of the definition of health data that will cover the entire life cycle, not only from the provision of healthcare, but from diagnostics, from anticipation of preventative medicine, right through to the far end, which would be the administration, allocation of insurance, the administration and, and processing of insurance claims, etc. Because health data will permeate that entire life cycle, and as such, will come into the focus of the GDPR. There's specific reference to diagnostics, to uh, big data analytics is coming into the focus of the legislation. There's reference to biometric and genetic data getting specific definitions and specific treatment within the clauses of the legislation, particularly to get an additional level of protection, an additional level of, of, of uh, care under the provisions of the GDPR. And as I say, we look in a little bit about the challenges for the controller and the processor, as well as the much lauded and infamous role of the data protection officer and again, something to consider for you 
in terms of candidates, in terms of who you'd be nominating for that role, where they might be within the organisation, uh, and the likely candidates that you might either have to bring in or identify and train within your organisations over the coming year and a half. The GDPR principles, those of you who are already familiar with the existing legislation, uh, and particularly those of you who may have tattooed the eight rules somewhere about your presence, uh, you may have to re-tattoo. There are seven principles under the legislation. I'd be happy to provide these slides to you. The, uh, the pixelation isn't always great on the photographs. So you'll recognize in the language of these seven principles much of the spirit of the eight data protection rules as they currently exist. Rule one is still there in terms of fairness and transparency of the processing. Rule two is also there that the purpose of the limitation or the, the purpose of your processing of the data should be limited to the lawful and reasonable purposes for which you have set expectations with the data subject. So again, a challenge there not to be doing unsolicited or unexpected or certainly uh, you know un untelegraphed processing of the data. The data subject should be informed and then your subsequent processing of the data should remain within that purpose. A new challenge is going to be minimization. The languages of the legislation specifically targets that there would be no bells and whistles, no excessive or unexpected processing. And underneath all of this is a new challenge for data controllers and processors to be able to demonstrate compliance, the demonstrable evidence that you are being compliant with the legislation. For example, show how the processing you're conducting is minimized to the minimum necessary to achieve the objective or the purpose for which you have the data. That element of minimization, but also the element of demonstrable evidence is going to be a, a permeating factor under the new regulation. Rule five is still in there under uh, principle four, your obligation to keep the data accurate and up to date. Again, often neglected by our clients, often neglected by organizations. There's a degree of complacency creeps in once you have the data, and once it's in a safe place, who can get at it? And the reality is that the world keeps moving. So circumstances change. People's preferences, people's location, people's name, even people's level of interest will modify over time. And it's in your interest, particularly from a marketing, from a diagnostics, or from a research point of view, to keep track of and keep up to date with those changes. So the degree to which you invest and put effort and resource into maintaining the quality of your data will fundamentally impact the quality of your campaigns, but also the, the confidence that you have in funding or in sending that data out. So, again, no change there in that point. Number five, principle five, is an echo of rule seven for the current legislation, and that is to keep the data for as long as necessary, but only at that point to consider the appropriate destruction. A nuance has been added to principle five. The legislation specifically says, keep the data in a manner that allows identification for as long as necessary. And what this introduces is a new challenge for organizations, not only to consider how long you're keeping the data, but also to consider, is there a, a midpoint, an interim point, where we could remove the identifying features, keep the remaining data for our diagnostic, or for statistical, or for our research purposes, but still achieve compliance. The good news is that if you remove that identifying feature, then data protection is no longer, or certainly less, of an issue, because the individual is no longer identifiable. But for organizations considering their retention schedules or their destruction schedules, principle five is going to introduce an additional consideration, and that is, do we actually need to be able to identify the individual? Could we achieve the same objective without doing so? And if so, Let's introduce a process that removes that identifying uh, element at the earliest possible point in the life cycle. Rule four is still out there. Good old trusty, reliable source of all those headlines. Rule four around security of the data and the confidentiality of the processing. So again, no changes there. Equally unhelpfully with the previous legislation, the, help, the legislation doesn't tell you how. It leaves that up to you. Whether it's, all it does is remind you that your legal and your, so, your security obligations apply equally to your electronic as well as to your manual or paper records. So your encryption, your processing, your premises, the level of accessibility, the authorization levels of staff, the appropriate training and awareness of staff, etc. We did a survey about two years ago for a similar conference 
And one of the key findings from it, having spoken to 400 companies who experienced a data protection breach, was that 72% of the breaches were attributable to the deliberate, non-malicious actions of staff. A lot of those breaches would have emanated or uh, incarnated as a breach of Rule 4, Principle 6, failure to keep the data safe and secure. So the takeaway from that is, you can address 70 odd percent of your risk profile by training, awareness raising, proper governance and appropriate procedures and policies. The hackers are still out there, the, the malicious intent is still out there, but a substantial proportion of your risk obligation can be addressed internally with appropriate measures and protocols. And lastly and unfortunately, the focus comes on the data controller because Principle 7 introduces the concept of liability and accountability. Somebody needs to be responsible and somebody needs to be in charge. This is seen typically as leading towards the data protection officer, but you need to remember that liability remains with the data controller and the data processor throughout. The data protection officer is simply the officer uh, tasked with making sure that compliance is achieved and maintained within the organization. I won't dwell on these too much, but some of the a smattering of the challenges that data controllers and processors will have. The concept of a joint controller has been defined. Those of peer organizations with whom you share data, you will now need to have a formal contract in place, outlining not only what data is shared, but the proportion of accountability that you will take on with those. So if you're a hospital, if you're a clinic, clinician, uh, a teaching university, whatever, where you share personal data, there needs to be formal tracking and cover for that data through a joint controller agreement. You'll have the opportunity to establish uh, presence in a single European market. So even if you're involved currently in multiple markets, multiple jurisdictions, the GDPR by its nature will allow you to formally record establishment in a single jurisdiction and thereby comply with the findings, the courts, and the investigative powers of the commissioner in that respective jurisdiction. So again, a challenge, particularly for those of you with international presence in multiple jurisdictions, to start considering which one or where are the key decisions, or where are the, where's the bulk of the data processing uh, by which we can decide where to, to uh, formally record establishment. I mentioned before about the demonstrable evidence of compliance. The key element is going to be introduced through the formal logging of data management processes. And this is going to be a proactive, demonstrable evidence through logs and, and recording of the key processing activities of any organization, whether you're a data controller or a data processor. That, from what we see with our clients, is going to be a substantial culture change for a lot of organizations. And the sooner you start getting into that discipline and getting into that process, the better to be ready for May 2013. The last one I mentioned there was the privacy impact assessment. The legislation is introducing the concept of privacy by design and default. In shorthand, it means any proposed change that will involve risk or introduce risk to personal data within your organization. This could be a new system, it could be a new application, engaging with a new service provider, moving into a new market, or even providing a new service. To the extent that it introduces risk to personal data, you will be required to proactively conduct an impact assessment, evaluate the risk of that, and put appropriate structures in place. Not only to conduct that process, but to document it and have the evidence to hand if it's ever challenged or queried at a point in the future. So again, a substantial culture change for a lot of organizations. The last point I'll mention, <coughs> excuse me, the last point I'll mention is in the context of the data processing. You're probably familiar with the fact that currently, if you engage the services of a third-party service provider for your data management activities, you must have a data processor contract in place. The legislation is relatively quiet on the fact other than that it must exist. The GDPR is introducing not only the promotion of that principle, but also the fact that every contract must now contain 12 specific itemized clauses that must be addressed. Things like the right of access, the obligations and parameters within which the processor operates, their obligation towards confidentiality, their obligation to respond in a timely manner to the requirements of the data subject or of the data controller. All of those promotions are going to be there and all of those challenges will need to be addressed somewhere between now and May 2018 
in order to be fully compliant. And the GDPR is exercising and probably presenting itself as an excellent catalyst for organizations to now look at their data, look at their records, the legacy data, the quality of consent, and primarily the quality of those contracts that exist between you, your organization, and your service providers. So I'll leave you with those thoughts. It was only a bombardment and apologies for the, the, the rattling off of the various considerations. We're outside, we're at stand number 117 over at the corner there, perfectly located just inside the door. Thanks again to the organizers for that. And we're here all day. If we can follow up with you or if we can answer any questions, we'd be more than happy to do so. Thanks very much for your attention.